Well, hello, Christ Church of the Valley, and welcome to Sunday School once again uh, in this situation where we can't be in person, but uh, I, I appreciate you still joining me this morning as we open up God's Word once again. And so let's go ahead and start uh, this devotion through the book of Romans. Uh, this time we'll be in Romans chapter 2, starting in verse 6 and going to verse 16, which will be quite a few verses, uh, but uh, hoping to get through it in a reasonable amount of time. Now with that, in a previous video, I was um, critical of the cliché once saved, always saved. And I think that uh, th this, this doctrine or this idea is important to this chapter, uh, but truly I believe that uh, once saved, always saved, the cliche, is a perversion of what Calvin actually taught, John Calvin that is, uh, and that would be preservation, uh, preservation or perseverance of the saints. And in Calvin, under his doctrine of election, those who are truly elect will remain faithful. And that is quite different than once saved, always saved. Now, I don't object to eternal security. I actually believe there are many passages in the Bible that lend credence to eternal security. However, I believe that eternal security needs to be balanced with the Bible's message of believers not disobeying and not falling away. Uh, once saved, always saved strikes of what is sometimes called fire insurance and has been used as a carte blanche to sin. That is, uh, I was saved when I was eight years old. I walked the aisle. I said the sinner's prayer, despite the fact that Calvin would have no idea what the sinner's prayer was. But uh, uh, this person ha has uh, received Jesus and was saved at a young age, but now in adulthood uh, chooses to live a life of immorality, chooses to sin and so forth and says, don't worry, I was once saved, and once saved, always saved. That's really a perversion of what Calvin actually taught, and not a good representation of, um, of preservation of the saints. Now with that, the section of scripture we're about to get into uh, I believe can be uh, misrepresented and therefore I believe we have to keep in context that the section we're about to deal with verses 6 through 16 come immediately after verses 1 through 5 and who is in view in 1 through 5 and that being uh, who we should see then Paul uh, making a contrast with. Now in verses 1 through 5 we met this you person uh, and Paul describes them as a moralist and one who condemns others for their sins and yet commits the very same sins. Now uh, remember that chapter 2 began with therefore which links chapter 2 with chapter 1. In chapter 1 Paul used homosexuality as uh, kind of a, a, a sticking point for sexual perversion within the Gentile world. But Paul also went on in chapter 1 verses 20 9, 30, and 31 to list a litany of uh, types of sin, unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, uh, evil, uh, murder, strife, deceit, gossip, all of these things. And so this moralist that we meet here in chapter 2, I don't think that they have to be inherently necessarily guilty of, for example, homosexuality, but they could be guilty of sexual sins. But we don't even have to limit it to sexual sins because Paul doesn't limit it to sexual sins. He goes on uh, to, to list all of these kinds of sins. And this moralist seems to be able to recognize sin in other people, but gives himself a carte blanche to continue sinning. He is mistreating God's kindness and tolerance and patience. He is misunderstanding that God's timing allows people 
time to repent, and by so doing, they're storing up for themselves wrath in the day of judgment. And I think that that is critical and very important to keep in mind this person as we continue here in chapter 2. With that, let's go ahead and pick it up in verse 6. God will repay to each person according to what they have done. To those who, uh, by persistence in doing good, seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But to those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be judgment, excuse me, there will be wrath and anger. Now, starting in verse 5, Paul has begun to speak of judgment uh, and this kind of judgment here in Paul is the eschatological or end times judgment. And uh, previously in chapter 1, Paul did talk about uh, wrath being poured out in the present uh, tense. That is, when people sin, they face consequences in this life for those sins. Uh, but here Paul is talking about a day of judgment, that day to come. And Paul is not simply making something up out of thin air with this. This idea that God will judge people comes out of uh, the Hebrew scriptures. You notice that Paul there quoted from Psalm 110 verse 5, who will render to each according to his deeds. Now, Jesus says something very similar to this in Matthew, Matthew chapter 12, verse 36. But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an account for it on the day of judgment. Now this, to me, is actually one of the most scary verses in the Bible. And the reason it's scary to me is because there are bad drivers. And those bad drivers make me say careless things sometimes. And I read these words of Jesus and I don't want to give account for the things that I've carelessly spoken. Uh, in so doing that, where I shift the blame from my personal responsibility to the bad drivers, am I becoming that moralist that Paul is warning about here? Quite possibly. But here Jesus is saying that there will be a day of judgment when everybody will give account. Now this matches Jesus elsewhere. Jesus chapter 10 verse 15, 11 verse 12, and 24. Now before I go any further, each one of those verses mean what that verse means in its context. And it's very important to keep all verses in their context. Here by citing it, I'm saying that Paul has the same thing thought as these verses, but those verses have to be kept in their context. But uh, Jesus isn't the only one to uh, talk about a day of judgment. Uh, Paul has already, by the time he's writing the book of Romans, has already spoken of the day of judgment. Uh, Acts chapter 17, there Paul is preaching to the Areopagus, and he says to them, because God has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Paul points to this day of judgment in which God will judge men through Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ is that one that he raised from the dead in this context. Uh, now, uh, go ahead and at your leisure, hit the pause button and write down these passages. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, uh, chapter 3, verse 7, 1 John chapter 4, verse 17, and Jude uh, verse 6. And you will see that Paul is not simply inventing this idea of a day of judgment when God will judge all people. This day of judgment is seen both in Jesus and throughout the rest of the Old, excuse me, and throughout the rest of the New Testament. And I think that that's something that we all need to see. 
later here in the book of Romans, we'll see Paul saying that for we must all stand before the uh, before God's judgment seat. Romans chapter fourteen, uh, verse ten b. Uh, also, he's already written by this point. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse ten. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. All of these, once again should be read in their context. But what Paul is about to speak here in uh, Romans chapter 2 about this day of judgment is what we see elsewhere in the New Testament. Um, now this judgment day, I don't believe it is uh, primarily the, the day that it's decided who is saved and who is lost. Instead, this day of judgment uh, fulfills Jesus' parable of the talons. You see this in Matthew chapter 25. It's also repeated in Luke chapter uh, 19. And at the same time, yes, this will be the eschatological judgment, uh, Matthew 25, the sheep and the goats, where uh, the two groups are separated. And keep that in mind. This idea of separating people into two groups as we read this uh, section where Paul is talking about this day of judgment. I think that that is uh, very important. I don't believe then that this judgment is inherently all about salvific judgment. That is to say, I don't think that the main point is who is and who is not saved. However, the idea of judgment, especially believers, being judged based on what they did, um, again, that's an Old Testament and a New Testament concept. Uh, you can see several verses here. Old Testament and New Testament. Go ahead and pause the video at your leisure. Uh, write down these passages and then read them in their context. And I think you will see that uh, this is not salvific judgment inherently, but instead uh, the judgment that uh, just once again separates the sheep from the goats. Uh, picking it up again in uh, verse 7, to those who by persistence in doing good works seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But to those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. Is Paul teaching works salvation? I feel the need to address this once again, although I, I, I did address it in the last video. Uh, I believe that you could eisege verse 7 and then make it teach work salvation. And what eisegeing is, opposed to exegeing, uh, eisegeing is isolating a passage and ignoring everything going on and simply making that passage uh, um, stand alone. Uh, and if you did that to verse 7, then I suppose you could... Uh, build a case for Paul teaching work salvation. However, you have to then uh, separate it from the rest of the context of, of chapter 2 here. You also have to ignore Paul elsewhere in the New Testament, and I don't believe that that's what you're supposed to do when you're trying to interpret the Bible. And instead, verses 7 and 8 should be read in the context of uh, chapter 2, and that is 7 and 8 is talking about two classes that are being contrasted one against the other. And I see in that Matthew 25, the sheep and the goats. Uh, now, these people in, in uh, verse 7 that um, perseverance in doing good works, seeking, and so forth, the doing of good works here is the bearing of fruits in keeping with repentance to uh, quote John the Baptist. Um, and with that, though, I want to point out something very interesting that I don't think you can miss here in this section. Starting in verse 9, there will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek, we could translate it Gentile, but glory, honor, and peace to everyone who does good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Verse 11, for there is no partiality with God. Now, there is a chiastic structure going on here 
in verses 6 through 11. Uh, chiastic structure is a very Jewish way of writing. We see it throughout the Old Testament. And here we're seeing it in Paul. V6 would be the A statement. V7 would be the B statement. And V8 would be the C statement. V9 would be the counter C statement, uh, verse 10 would be the counter B statement, and verse 11 would be the counter A statement. So, verse 6, God judges everybody. V7, good will uh, gain eternal life. The, the people who pursue good and do good will gain eternal life. Verse 8, those who persist in evil will suffer wrath. Verse 9, wrath is the result of doing evil. Uh, verse 10, blessing is the result of doing good. And verse 11, God judges all. But let's uh, keep going here with uh, verse 12, uh, and we'll go through verse 13. But all who sin without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. Verse 13, For it is not the hearer of the law who are justified before God, but it is the doers of the law who will be justified. Now, once again, we see a continuation of uh, this two-group system being separated out here. And starting here in verse 12, we see two groups. We see group A, who are without the law, and group B, who are with the law. Obviously, group A, in this case, would be the Gentiles, and, verse, uh, and group B would be the Jews. And they are judged, group A, without the law, and group B, with the law, and Paul specifically says that it is the doers and not the hearers of the law that are justified before God. And once again, I don't see this great chasm between Paul and James, because this is practically what James says in chapter 1, verse 22. Uh, we'll go ahead and wrap it up with our final verses here, 14, 15, and 16. Uh, for when Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law are a law unto themselves, in that they show the works of the law written in their hearts, their consciences bearing witness, and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. Verse 16, on the day when according to my gospel, so this is what Paul preaches, God will judge the secrets of men through Jesus Christ. So Paul is just pointing out that sometimes, although the Gentiles didn't have the law of Moses, sometimes they simply obeyed the law of Moses. And uh, obviously then, sometimes they didn't. The same way a Jew, although he possessed the law, he could obey or he could disobey. Now Paul mentions consciences here, their consciences uh, either accusing or defending them. Um, now, in uh, the, the post-Enlightenment Western world, we hear the term conscience, and perhaps we think of Jiminy Cricket, uh, perhaps we think of that negative voice in the back of our head that's always negative and so forth. That's really not Paul's intention here with this, because you, you'll notice that Paul talks about their conscience bearing witness and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. So the conscience isn't simply a negative voice that, that is beating you down and telling you you did wrong and you know you did wrong, but conscience can also work with you did well, you, you did what you were supposed to do. And according to Paul, when he preaches, there is a day when God will judge all and even the secrets of their hearts, which I think draws us back to that person, that you, that we met at the beginning of the chapter, the one who continues to sin, but secretly, uh, you know, keeps it keeps it under wraps you know outwardly has that moral ex exterior uh, and so forth and judges others 
but internally, secretly has this sin life. And it's even that which will be judged by God on the day of judgment, according to Paul. With that, we're going to wrap it up this morning. Thank you again for joining us. I'm having such a good time being in the book of Romans. I hope you're enjoying this too. And we will pick it up again next time, chapter 2, starting in verse 17. Christ Church of the Valley, I just want to continue to encourage you to stay strong during this time. It is difficult being away from each other and being apart from each other, but I hope to encourage you to continue strong in the faith. Keep on checking the website, keep on checking our Facebook, and we just continue to try and uh, connect with you during this time. Again, if you have needs, be sure to uh, make those needs known, known to us. We would love to see if we can meet any needs people have. We would love to continue to connect in some way, in some fashion during this time. Once again, I'm going to continue to pray for you. I hope you continue to pray for me.